Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in 1 Corinthians, but first I want to talk about 70. It has a sacred meaning in Scripture. It's made up of, uh, of the factors of two perfect numbers, 7 representing perfection and 10 representing completeness, uh, as well as God's law. And as such, it, it symbolizes perfect spiritual order carried out with all power. That's what the number 70 represents. Now, it can also represent a, a period of judgment. And why do I say that? Well, because 70 elders were appointed by Moses. We know that from Numbers chapter 11. After reading the covenant God gave him, to read to the people, Moses took 70 elders along with Aaron and his sons up Mount Sinai to have a special meeting with God himself. Exodus, uh, chapter, tw Exodus chapter 24. Now ancient Israel, they spent a total of a number of 70 years in captivity in Babylon. You know, not 69, not 71, but 70. And 70 is especially connected with Jerusalem. Uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, you could, you could name that. The, the city kept 70 years of Sabbaths while Judah was in Babylonian captivity. That's Jeremiah 25. Uh, everybody knows pretty much or is familiar with the 77s, uh, 490 years determined upon Jerusalem for for it to complete its transgressions, to make an end for sins, and for everlasting righteousness to enter into it. We know that from J Daniel chapter 9. There's a lot that can be said for 70. Uh, the father of Abraham, Terah, who was, uh, 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 well, Terah, he, it was his oldest son. He had his first male child at 70. You know, Canaan, the fourth biblical patriarch mentioned in Scripture, had his first son at the age of 70. Uh, there was a total of 70 Israelites started a nation within another nation that would grow to more than 2 million by the time of the Exodus. Now, it's, uh, we can't forget the 70 elders, not counting the high priest, who composed Israel's great tribunal uh, which was uh, eventually called the Sanhedrin. Uh, Seventy disciples were sent out by Christ on a training mission in order to preach the gospel to the surrounding area. Now, folks, is all this a coincidence? Well, of course not. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel was taken by God in vision to Jerusalem to be shown 70 elders of Israel defiling themselves by offering incense to their idols. If you've read the book of Ezekiel, you know that. Seven nations border Israel. That's, that's kind of amazing. Uh, you've got Egypt, you've got Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, the Palestinian territories of of West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and then it also shares maritime borders with Cyprus. Now that's seven. David, he, King David, died at the age of 70. God takes Queen Elizabeth II after a 70-year reign, and this after seeing all of the Trump sevens, the Trump phenomenon, uh, there were 70 years, 1947 to 2017. We just saw the 77th United Nations General Assembly in 2022, where Prime Minister Lapides offering land for peace. Jupiter, which represents Christ, closest to Earth in 70 years tomorrow, tomorrow, September 26th, during Feast of Trumpets in the seventh Hebrew month. And the church is raptured, leading to seven years tribulation, to be followed by the second coming where there's seven days of tabernacles. You know, and then we go on to the kingdom age. That's, that's, that completes the 7,000 years. 
Nothing wrong with thinking it may be on a Feast of Trumpets. Nothing wrong with thinking it may occur on a Pentecost. Okay? Nothing wrong with, with that at all. Nothing wrong with this at all. Now, if you go around saying, well, you know, the Lord's going to come back on July 4th, you know, of 1776 on, on the, the day that the, you know, that Declaration of Independence was signed. I mean, if that's what you do, if that's what you're doing, that's wrong. But if you're looking forward to him coming on a Feast of Trumpets, and if he doesn't, then you look, you look forward to the next spring, the Pentecost, and, and you're, you're really on the edge of your seat all the time in between. And if you're looking for him to come, there is nothing wrong with that, okay? Nothing is wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. That is not date setting, okay? Big difference between date setting and being eager and anticipating and being watchful and loving our Lord's return and praying and hoping and saying, come Lord Jesus, which is how the Bible ends. Nothing wrong with it at all. Now, uh, there's something that could be said for, and uh, I just want to mention one other, other thing before we get into our study here in 1 Corinthians. Where is the promise of His coming? Says, you know, is, is what we read in, P, in Peter. All right? What's the context? The context is the last days. We've been in the last days since 70 AD. We've been in the last days since Christ was last here. These, this final last 2,000 years is defined as the last days, okay? The last days doesn't define a year or two at the end of, of everything here. We've been in the last days for a long time. That's the context. People have been saying, where is the promise of His coming for thousands of years? 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years. Been, this is not something that they're recently saying, or it's not something that they're going to say future, future tense. This is something that has been said ever since he left. Okay? Just read Peter. Where is the promise of his coming? What's really important about that passage there in 1 Peter is it tells us clearly how we are to occupy ourselves until He comes. Because He's not willing that any of His people should perish, that therefore we are clearly shown what ought to be our priority as we await His return. And I don't see how we can do anything better than Continue on in the study of God's Word, preaching so that His people will hear because He's not willing that any of them should perish. And of course, they will not perish. So that's where we're at. We're looking forward to His return this fall. If He doesn't return, then I'm going to be looking forward to His return through the winter and into the spring and probably into the summer, and maybe into the next fall. And that's just how it is. That should not offend a single Christian. That you would have Christians all over the place, so eager for His return. I think we have a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons for being anxious for His return. So in the meantime, we're going to do what we should. We're going to continue on in our study in the epistle to the Corinthians verse by verse. And we are in the subject of tongues. It will go on until probably the end of the chapter. That's where we're at. And Lord willing, that's what we will do. Now in our last study together, we had reached verse 13 to chapter 14. 1 Corinthians is the primary epistle in the New Testament addressed by God Himself to a carnal church. That They were told in chapter 2 that they were acting like people made of flesh. 
This book is also the primary testimony concerning the subject of tongues. We have a few verses about tongues in Acts uh, chapter 2. And we had some comments here in the early chapters of this book. And there's a few in 1 Timothy. But chapter 14, folks, of 1 Corinthians is the primary text on tongues. Now, most translations that use the word tongue speak of an unknown tongue. Actually, it's a language. The inference in the word is that it is a language that you didn't previously know. You are now speaking in a known language, not some gibberish, but a known language. A language that you hadn't previously known, a language that you hadn't previously studied, and that's the subject of this chapter. In our study so far, we've seen that the Holy Spirit likens those who use tongues as children. That tongues are contrasted between those who are children and those who are mature. That's the contrast that we see. We've seen that the tongues are a lesser gift, that there are better things to seek than to speak in tongues, and more importantly than that, that what is proclaimed in the fellowship should build up the church. And that word edifying, edifying permeates this chapter. When we reach the 13th verse, uh, as a result of our study so far, let him that speaks in a language, a language that was unknown to him pray. And that, that is an imperative. It's a command. Pray that he may interpret. Now, there have been many, many recordings made of people speaking in tongues. And many of those, in fact, uh, I'd say the great majority of them, it's nothing but gibberish. But to be fair with tongue speaking, uh, there were recordings of someone speaking a known language. And then there were people who claimed to have the, the gift of interpretation. And so these recordings were taken to those people. In several cases that I know of, there were three or four who professed to have the gift of interpretation. And so they listened to the same tape and we got four different messages. And when that was pointed out to the interpreters, they said, well, uh, they said, well, that's perfectly reasonable because God is it, God in giving that the gift of interpretation gives different interpretation, uh, different various interpretations. They give for various speaking in tongues. So I guess you can make a scripture say anything that you want. Dearly beloved, that can be a serious criticism against speaking in tongues, but it is a, it's a serious criticism to the rest of us as well. How much do we try to read into passages of Scripture something that isn't there, something that we want it to say? We bring our prejudiced ideas to the, to the book and we look for some validation of them there, something that we want it to say. I've tried to argue over the need to look at the words, to look at the grammar, and to study diligently to see what God's saying. And I think that is vital, vitally important. John chapter 10, why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, that means, yeah, that means that you haven't personally accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your own uh, personal Savior so that you become his sheep. No, that's, that's the normal interpretation anyway. But, dearly beloved, that isn't what the words say. And it's unbelievable how many times that we try to make Scripture support what we, we've already concluded to be true. I'm persuaded. Uh, this is a personal opinion. Nobody has to agree with me here on, on anything I say. I have tried diligently for years to warn folks against agreeing with anything I say. I'm not a, some source of truth, all-knowing truth, okay? I am, as you are, one who loves this book, who longs to study it, to know its truth, and my conclusions may or may not be true. Your responsibility is not to believe me. Your responsibility is to search the scriptures diligently, daily, to see whether or not these things be so. And, and I want to do that. I want to make sure that I'm being fair with this book. This is God's Word. In verse 13, if you're going to speak in a language that others don't understand, you're commanded to pray, to seek, to interpret or, or translate, you know, what is said. And that's what I was pointing out about, about those who interpreted tape recordings that were, that were made, uh, you know, of tongues. You know, they came up with different ideas. Pray that he may translate or interpret. The argument appears to be in verse 13 that if you're going to speak in a language that others don't understand, then your command, the command given you by God Almighty, is that you be the one who is able to interpret or translate what you said. You know, whereas normally the, there's, there's got to be somebody with a gift of interpretation. You have a gift of tongues, and that's the way people have made it seem. Now, dearly beloved, I don't mean to be critical. And I love each and every one of my brothers and sisters in Christ. But I believe that there are many of them who are wrapped up in the tongues movement. They love the Lord. They're going to be in heaven, and I'm going to be there. You know, I'm going to be there in heaven saying, well, I told you so. You know. All right, that was a joke. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't point out when there are errors in the church. Now, how many people spoke in tongues at Pentecost, the first Pentecost? The Spirit fell on them. Okay, who was the them? Only the disciples. The crowd wasn't speaking in tongues. People from all those nations, they weren't speaking in tongues. They were hearing in their own language. Well, who was doing the preaching? The disciples. And yet there are multiplied thousands, probably thousands upon thousands of Pentecostals who say at Pentecost, the gift of speaking in tongues fell on everybody. Everybody. So everybody was speaking in tongues. They weren't. They weren't. It was just the apostles. They're the only ones that spoke in tongues. And they spoke in languages that all those visitors to Jerusalem understood. You got to remember, this was a time of year when Jerusalem was highly populated from many, many, many nations. 
And here were 11 or 12 men, I assume uh, Matthias was now one of the disciples, speaking in languages, these, all these different nations, these different ethnic groups, language speakers understood. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden that we have people saying that the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that you speak in tongues. And we're soon going to see that, no, no, tongues are a sign for unbelievers. Tongues are, were a sign for unbelievers, and we have a whole group of people that think tongues are a sign for believers. You know, if you've really received the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. So tongues is a sign of the fact that you receive the Holy Spirit when God clearly declares, clearly, wherefore, verse 22, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe. So you can't possibly take that position and call it biblical. If you're going to speak in a language that others don't understand, then, then you sh should have the ability, you should at least plead for the ability to translate. Because verse 14, if I pray in a language others don't understand, my spirit may pray, but my understanding is unfruitful, unfruitful. You know, who wants unfruitful understanding? I don't understand anything. What is it then? What will I do? Will I speak in tongues? No. I will pray with the Spirit. And I will pray with the understanding. At the same time, I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the, the understanding at the same time. That's what I'm going to do. If I'm going to speak in a tongue that I don't understand and those around me don't understand, I, I'm not going to do that. And yet, the Pentecostals not only do that, but they argue that you should do that. Verse 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing that he understandeth not what thou sayest? Now, that is a, that's a big expression. That word unlearned means... Well, it's where we get our word idiot, but the, the word means one who hasn't had the gift of understanding that tongue. How shall he say amen? Except it's articulated, the amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he doesn't understand what you say. It's an interesting verse. Uh, it seems as though when we are in fellowship with, together with one another, uh, speaking the truth of God's Word, it ought to be giving of thanks. I've mentioned this, in, in fact, in every, just about every teaching video. I pointed out to you that I believe very seriously that this is God's Word. not man's. Are we studying a letter written by the Apostle Paul to believers at Corinth? Well, of course, in one sense of the word, absolutely. But, but Paul is not the author. The author is the Almighty Eternal God, and this epistle is a timeless letter. It's as much for us as it was for those at Corinth. This is God's eternal word, and God wants us to understand these things. 
what should our fellowship together be? Wherever, wherever we gather, you know, out in the middle of a prairie someplace or on Facebook or in church, the giving of thanks. I don't know whether I can make it clear or not. If we, if we give thanks, truly give thanks, it is an open admission that we understand that our God does all things well. And you and I both know that oftentimes when things get really tough, it can be difficult to trust God concerning that circumstance, whatever that might happen to be. What, what we should all be asking ourselves is do we really believe that the God that we worship is God? Are there areas of your life where he's out of control? You know, what kind of father is he? Is he a loving, heavenly father? Or does he, he, just, or does he just let you go your own way, get into all kinds of trouble and stuff, and, 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 and sit up there and hoping, maybe God's praying, uh, you know, I don't know, hoping, I don't know who would be praying to, hoping you'll learn some lessons. I, I don't know what your approach to God is. He, said, he tells me that He works all things together for your good. I do not see how any, any coming to God can be anything but giving thanks. Don't be concerned about anything, but in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I didn't write that, folks. Don't worry about anything. Don't be concerned about anything. But in everything, give thanks and let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes understanding shall guard, the word keep there means guard, your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Dearly beloved, the reason most of the Christians that you know don't have peace is because apparently they don't believe him concerning what that verse says. Christians can become very angry with God when some kind of situation occurs. Christians go through very tough situations. I'd hate to be mad at somebody that big. I mean, you're never going to win being mad at God. The wonderful truth of His Word is He's not mad at you. His love for you is, is not only everlasting, but it's never changing. If there's any time in your life when God really loved you, it's the same now. His love has never changed. This is, I don't see how, in all honesty, if we understand what God has done for us and how sovereign He is, that we, we could come to Him in anything but thanksgiving. You know, I'm astounded that He still loves me. He says, The Amen at the giving of thanks. You, you notice in, that in that verse, that's what ought to happen when you're blessing God's people. It's giving thanks. You know, think of the God that we worship. I'm telling you that God is in absolute control in your life, that God is working in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure, and he has a lot of exhortation there to, for us to study, to show ourselves approved. Why do I have to do that if he's sovereign? If God is working all things together for my good, why study? Well, because he told me to. You know, think about it. You know, here's somebody that never opened a Bible. They believe that Jesus Christ died for them. And they're redeemed. They lived all their life. They had a lot of fun. Never studied. 
never went to church, hardly at all, and they wind up in heaven. And here's somebody else who studied like a demon all his life, winds up in hell. Why study? You, know, you don't study to go to heaven. You don't study to win merit points. We study, folks, because God said to study. Why should I walk worthy of the vocation wherewith I'm being called? Because He told me to. He told me to. You know, I can't come up with any other reason. He said so. And because I love Him, I know He loves me. And that's what's supremely important. That He loves me. You know, many, many, many years ago, you know, I said one time, Lord, I'm thankful. I love you. I'm just so thankful that I love you. And I thought how, well, that, that what I'm really thankful for is that you love me. That's what's important. And I walk worthy because he asked me to, or at least or at least try to. I study because he told me to. I pray because he told me to. Not because I doubt his sovereignty. I, I absolutely believe, absolutely, that God is absolutely sovereign. Okay? And it, it looks to me like my text is saying the person that's going to say the amen is the one who recognizes your giving of thanks. I doubt that you can stand up and, and complain about how rotten your life is and somebody say amen. You know, amen means let it be so. It means so be it. You know, it means it, amen means it is true. Okay, God is to be thanked. We are always to come before Him, first of all, with thanksgiving. And, and clearly that's the subject of verse 16. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy coming of thanks, seeing that he understandeth not what thou sayest? He doesn't even understand that you're giving thanks. Well, why would I want to do that? I want to bring praise and glory to God because, because He's God. You know, and, and because He's God, He can do with me whatever He pleases. Verse 17, For thou ver verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. And once again, we're back to edification. It's, this, it's why? Because that's the subject here. The chapter is replete with edification. That's what we ought to do when we fellowship together, is build each other up. You know, you, you can't build each other up speaking languages people don't understand. You know, if, uh, if you're doing a good job giving thanks, it's of no value to anyone else if they don't understand. They're not built up. And people need to be built up. More than ever today. And God has said we should give thanks for all things. And I, I doubt that there are very many Christians that do that. It's not an easy thing to do sometimes. Oh, it's easy to give thanks for, the, for all the, the good things, the great things. But I thank my God, verse 18, that I speak with languages more than you all. That I speak with languages more than you all. Now we can do a lot with that verse. And particularly the Pentecostals would. I, I thank the God, my God, that I speak with languages more than you all. And you'll notice, if you have the authorized version, uh, it doesn't have the word unknown in there anymore. For that, 
particular case, the two things that you can think about in that verse. First of all, he undoubtedly, Paul, was undoubtedly fluent in this, what, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, to name a few. I, I, and we're going back, what, 2,000 years? I mean, the normal American isn't fluent in five languages. Most people in Oklahoma can barely speak one. Clearly, Paul could read, write, and speak five languages at least, probably more. So he did speak. He, he did speak with languages more than most of them because he was highly educated. Uh, the most educated man in the Old Testament was Moses, and God used him greatly. The most educated man in the New Testament, and this is just my opinion, I, I believe was Paul, and God used him greatly. I'm not making any great appeal for education, folks, but neither do I like the inference that, that people, well, people don't, uh, people don't need to be educated. You know, just love the Lord. You know, there's, you know, there are two sides to that coin. But God did use educated people in giving forth His Word. Moses was very important in giving us a portion of Scripture that was authored by God. And uh, been the same with Paul. All of the doctrine that we know as doctrine, the Lord gave us through the Apostle Paul because he ordained Paul to complete the Word of God, that which is perfect. On the other hand, he may be saying here, uh, you notice he says, I speak with languages more than you all. You know, the Pentecostals, they would ask me to believe that Paul did a lot of his preaching in tongues. Folks, I, and I, I don't know I don't know whether that's true or not. Neither does a Pentecostal, you know, because he never did in the Scriptures. What the Holy Spirit led him to write has nothing to do with his speaking in tongue. You know, we just, we don't know of any case where he actually spoke in an unknown language, you know, of the gift of tongues. He may have. I'm not telling you he didn't. I'm not telling you he didn't. What I'm saying is, is it wasn't important enough, obviously, for God Almighty to include it that in his to include it in his word. But we shouldn't miss the point that Paul was a language expert. However, in the church, verse 19. I would rather speak only five words with my understanding. Five words. And, and so the inference then is that the word tongues in verse 18 should have had the word unknown with it. Now whether that's a, a language that they didn't know or a language unknown to him, I don't know. But the next verse says, in the church. So obviously he never used it in the church. I And I just said, we can't find it in the New Testament. Whatever he did in languages, unknown to him, if that's what that means, he didn't do it in the church. Which is exactly where the my... Blessed Pentecostal brothers and sisters in Christ want to do it. He didn't do it there. In fact, I would rather speak just five words with my understanding that I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a language. Okay? 10,000 words in a language. That's 2,000 to 1. 10,000 words in a language that's not understood. And that is absolutely contrary 
to the modern tongues movement. So far, I've tried to, to point out it's, it's childish, it's not mature, it's not a sign of the receiving of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's one faith, one spirit, one baptism. You know, we'll get into, into that more later. But think, think of it, all right? Five words that would build up those in the church, then 10,000 words in the language that they didn't understand. And now, all, and all of a sudden, we have the word brethren. Brethren. Amazing. And in, and in verse 20, Remember, this is the Holy Spirit. He's calling us brethren. He's calling these people at Corinth brethren. And he has already pointed out in the second chapter that they're living like they're made of flesh. Not only should we ought to live like we're spirit, not flesh, but we need to love our brothers and sisters who are not. You know, we're new creations in Christ. We have a new man. We have an old man. And we should live like who we are, new creations in Christ. Brethren. Okay? That's, that's what we read here. So whatever he is saying here, whether they're childish or whether they're mature, they are brethren. You know, it's so easy to assume that, that one who, who doesn't agree with your theology, well, you know, well, God, he just can't be a brother. Hold on. <laughs> can't do that. And, and folks, you can hold a doctorate degree in theology and you can be an infant. You can be childish. I know, I've got a first cousin, who, you know, who does have one, yet doctrinally he's an infant. But he loves the Lord. He lives for the Lord. Every opportunity he has, he would tell you about his loving Lord. He had testified to his faith in Christ Jesus. Theologically, he and I are worlds apart and blood kin, okay? I don't want to get mad at anybody that disagrees with me. I don't have any particular handle on the truth. I'm studying the same book that you are. But those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, or, or maybe I should put it differently, those of us who are known and loved by the Lord Jesus Christ are brethren. And I want to treat them that way. I don't want to ostracize them. I do believe that we have the responsibility that we are told to recognize false teaching, false teachers, false doctrine. And, and if it is false, you know, I think we have the opportunity, not, not just the opportunity, I think we have the obligation to state as much, to point that out. And we have the responsibility to, to say as much, but not as enemies. Not as enemies. Verse 20, brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Be mature. It's funny that that word malice there seems to be applied to tongues. That's what we're talking about. When we're mature, we put away childish things. Tongues ceased on their own. They ceased by themselves. Don't be children in the way that you understand. In evil, in malice, be children like that which, you know, glitters, that which entertains. But in our understanding, we ought to be mature. And, and the only way that we can be mature is to study this book. Verse 21, in the law, it has been written, perfect tense, so that it stands perfectly written with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear, saith the Lord. 
Verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Think of that. Dearly beloved, the whole Pentecostal tongues movement stresses the fact that tongues are a sign that you've received the Holy Spirit. Where'd they get that? Hmm. They made it up. What they do is they go back to Acts chapter 2 and they say that the gift of tongues fell on, on, on everybody there, all, all the multitude. It didn't. It didn't. It fell on his disciples. They're the ones who preached in the languages that others understood. The great bulk of Christians who were hearing what was preached were not speaking in tongues. <clears throat> the conclusion is that tongues are for a sign to unbelievers, not to believers. Because when God used tongues of another language, the Israelites did not believe. They did not hear. And folks today, they won't hear either. Well, we're going to look more at verse 21 when we meet again, if we're still here. God bless and keep every, each and every one of you. Our prayers are with you all as we move ever closer toward that day that the Lord comes for us. We love you. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.